beloved congregation of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, there once was a man who was convinced that he was led by the Holy Spirit to become a minister. As far as he was concerned, everything pointed to it. He was very sincere. He was full of zeal. He had become a recent convert and had thrown away his former way of life. He no longer drank or smoked or used bad language. He no longer went to wild parties. He regularly attended church. He sent his children to a Christian school. He was convinced in every way that he was being led by the Holy Spirit to become a minister. Even though he had a large family, he also had the financial means to pursue the ministry. His wife and children were behind him, and so were many others. So he sold his house, gave up his job, and studied for four years at the university, and then another five years at the theological college. He then became a minister, but he only lasted four years in the ministry. Then he quit. He also stopped going to church. He even stopped believing. How could that happen? Did the Holy Spirit make a mistake? Did the Holy Spirit mislead him? Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit does not make mistakes. The Holy Spirit is God and he is perfect. Men, however, make mistakes. Therefore, we have to be careful when we speak about being led by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you'll hear someone say that he or she is being led to a certain action. They will say, for example, that the Holy Spirit told them to take a different job or to move to another town. Or they will say that the Holy Spirit wants them to go to another church or even that the Holy Spirit is leading them to seek a divorce. So the question is, how do you know what the will of the Holy Spirit is? How does the Holy Spirit lead you? How does the Holy Spirit guide you to make certain decisions? How does God direct our lives? This is what we will deal with today. Our sermon is about the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We will see that God's Holy Spirit firstly guides all believers equally, secondly obligates all of us, and thirdly gives us the fullness of life. So the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and we will see that God's Holy Spirit guides all believers equally. When Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, he included all of the members belonging to that church in that location. He did not have in mind a specific member. He did not write to someone who stood out above the rest because of special revelation that he or she received from God and that others did not receive. Paul himself could claim that he was unique in this regard. For God spoke to him directly on the road to Damascus and inspired his letters so that Paul's words in those letters are actually God's words. The Holy Spirit used Paul and convinced the churches who received his letters that they were directly inspired by the Holy Spirit. We do not know how aware Paul himself was of the special revelation that he was receiving at the time that he was writing those letters. Paul knows himself to be just as great a sinner, if not a greater sinner, than others. Time and again he writes that in his letters. He was a humble man. It was Paul's passion to put God into the foreground, to give him the glory and to place himself as much as possible into the background. He did not want any special recognition because he was chosen as an apostle of God. <clears throat> but when the New Testament was complete, which happened during the first century after Christ, special revelation ceased. It was not necessary anymore. We now have the complete word of God. 
We do not need any more additions or revelations. There are those who think that God continues to speak to certain men. The Roman Catholics, for example, think that God's revelation is still given to the Pope and to the councils. And so over the years, their theology changes. The decrees of councils and of the Pope take precedence over the Bible. But this results in contradictions. They want us to believe, for example, that Mary was without sin and that she remained a virgin all her life. They also want us to believe that we do not have direct access to God except through Mary and other special people whom they call the saints. The list of their various contradictions to what we find in the Bible can go on and on. According to the Roman Catholics, Later revelations supplant the Bible. God continues to give revelation to the Roman Catholic Church of which the Pope is head. The Pope is now the vicar of Christ. That is, he now stands in the place of Christ and directly receives revelation from God. But in this way, they have the Holy Spirit say one thing first and then another thing later on as if the Holy Spirit speaks out of two sides of his mouth. The same thing is true of those who believe that the Holy Spirit speaks directly to them as individual believers, and so they speak in tongues. The speaking of tongues, according to them, is a direct revelation from God. And then the one tries to outdo the other to prove that the Holy Spirit speaks more to him or to her than to others. In this way they draw attention to themselves. This is especially dangerous when one of them elevates oneself above the others and he or she convinces others that they have to listen to him or her because he or she has a direct line to God. Churches with, e with such leaders become personality cults. They are sects, that is, followers of men. Brothers and sisters, special revelation has ceased. It ceased when the Bible became complete. God not, does not come to you and me with special revelation except with the special revelation of his word. What then does that leading of the Holy Spirit refer to? Some believe that this refers to his protective influence, that he leads your step in a certain way, so that you will not stumble or fall or come to any harm. Allow me to recount a tale to illustrate this point. In the Netherlands in 1834, during the time of the secession, there was a minister who was highly revered. One day he was informed that a certain member of his congregation was seriously ill. Although it was already evening, and although the minister had to go through heavily wooded territory where known criminals were on the prowl, the minister nevertheless went out on foot in order to be at that widow's side before her death. After reading and praying with her, he returned home safely. A couple of years later, two men, who through the faithful efforts of that very minister had recently been converted, asked him whether or not he remembered a few years ago, on a late Friday afternoon, that he went to that dying wood widow in the house on the other side of the woods. When the minister answered in the affirmative, they asked him, who were those two men in shining armour, walking on either side of you, guarding you? The minister replied, I was alone, my friends. I was all by myself, neither going nor returning. No one accompanied me. That's strange, they said, for we distinctly saw them. It made us afraid. So we hurried away. We are so glad that we were prevented from getting out our sinister plot. The commentator who related this story said that this was a popular story often told to indicate 
that this minister must have been one of the special saints of God, who was led by the Spirit, and that he was the object of exceptional divine protection. But, says the commentator, this is not what Paul has in mind here in Romans 8, verse 14. The reference here is not to the gift of the Spirit to a select few. Every child of God is led by the Holy Spirit. That does not mean that God does not protect us. Certainly it does. It may well be that the story about that minister really did happen. However, stories can often take on a life of their own. But if it did happen, but it did not happen so that we can elevate the one person above the other as one of God's special people. We are all God's special children. All the believers are led by the Holy Spirit. We do not have a class of special saints, as the Roman Catholic Church does. If you are a child of God, then the Holy Spirit is leading you, all of you. We come to the second point, namely the obligation that the Holy Spirit lays upon us. Paul writes in verses 12 and 13, We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But then he switches his focus to the Holy Spirit. Paul says, If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. In other words, Paul says it is not to the flesh that we have an obligation, but to the Holy Spirit. What is that obligation? It is to live in accordance with the will of God, to be guided by the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit guide us? Well, as we saw, the Holy Spirit does not come to us without means. He uses a medium. That medium is God's word. If you want to be led by the Holy Spirit, then you have to know what God says in his word, and you have to be in tune with it. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Anyone can study and quote the Bible. Many people do. The modern media, or legislators for example, will quote certain statements from the Bible, not in order to convince others of the truth of it, but in order to defeat a certain Christian point of view. They deliberately quote the scriptures out of context in order to prove their own point. That's also how Satan used scripture. In order to tempt the Lord Jesus in the wilderness, he quoted from the scriptures that God would give him special protection. But Satan was not appealing to God's spirit, but to the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted him to forego the suffering that he was about to endure. So he quoted scripture out of context in an attempt to lead him astray. But the Lord Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. He was not guided by the flesh, but guided by the Spirit. It is impossible for him not to be guided by the Holy Spirit, for he and the Holy Spirit are one. It is that unity that Paul also shows here in Romans 8. For he says in verse 9, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. Christ was without sin, because he was not guided by the flesh, but by the Holy Spirit. Now you see, brothers and sisters, that that is what Paul is talking about here when he speaks about being led by the Holy Spirit. And here we also come to the heart of the sermon. 
To be led by the Spirit means to be driven by Him, to lead a godly life. In your life, you allow the Holy Spirit to be in the driver's seat. As such, you are not just a passenger, but you are also an active participant. God wants you along as you make your way in life and as you look forward to your glorious end. The Holy Spirit leads you, yes, but he does not overpower you. He drives you, but he is not a slave driver. He does not take out the whip. He does not take over your spirit by force. No, he gently guides you. He guides you like a shepherd guides his sheep. Gently prodding, carefully leading his sheep along the right paths. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, and he is the Good Shepherd. How do you know that Good Shepherd? You know his voice. You know what he is like. You know that he always wants the best for you, even when you want to go in one direction, and he points you to go in the other direction. You know how to distinguish his voice from the voice of the devil. The devil wants to lead you astray and have you follow the ways of the flesh. But the Holy Spirit wants to keep you going on the right path. To be led by the Holy Spirit means that you study the meaning, the intent of the Holy Spirit as you find it in the Bible. You allow yourself to be guided by God's word. You had better not say that the Holy Spirit is guiding you when you are planning a sinful action. That is what people want to do when they want to cover up their own sins. That is what people do when they want to go their own way. In order to forestall any criticism, they will tell you that God is telling them what to do. In other words, I have a special revelation from God. And that makes me more special than you. I have greater insight than you do. Brothers and sisters, that is not only arrogant, that is also playing right into the hand of the devil. The same thing is true when you say that the Holy Spirit is guiding you towards a certain position in life, to a certain job or to a certain action. How do you know that it is not your own ambition driving you? How do you know that you are not being driven by your own wishes? You may wish, for example, to have a certain position in the church, to be an elder or deacon or to be a minister. And that is a good thing. As a matter of fact, it is a wonderful thing. But God's Holy Spirit is much wiser than you or me. There are certain things that the Holy Spirit does not deem suitable or good for you. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. He will do that in his own time and in his own way. How exactly does he lead you then? As I said, the Holy Spirit uses means. He uses the word of God but he also uses God's people who are in tune with the word of God in order to guide you. Listen to what Paul, speaking about the church, says in Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 7. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. After speaking about that, he speaks about the office bearers in the church, that they also, that they are also used by God as a means to guide God's people. They are God's gift. Paul says in the verses 11 to 13, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, 
till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure and the, of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The devil is very clever and cunning. He will try and make you believe that your will and way is God's will and way. Sometimes we get confused. We want something so bad that we become convinced that it is God's will that we have it. And sometimes we get so entrenched in our own way of thinking that we think we are going on the right path, even though we are on the wrong path. That is why God gives you the church and the office bearers in the church. They have been given, as it says in Hebrews 13, verse 17, the authority to... For they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Therefore, it says in that verse, obey those who rule over you and be submissive. The office bearers are given to the church to keep you on the right path, to warn you when you are going wrong, to encourage you to do the right thing. They are there to be a good example to you of what it means to lead a godly life. They have a great responsibility. Does that mean that they cannot make mistakes? Of course not. They can, and they do make mistakes. As they lead the flock, they have to constantly ask themselves whether or not they are being led by the Spirit as he has revealed himself in God's Word. But their collective opinion as to what the will of God is gives greater weight than the opinion of an individual believer. Collectively, we have much greater objectivity. That is why it says in Proverbs that a fool is someone who does not listen to the counsel of others. Please remember that when we talk about the office bearers, we are not just talking about a collection of individ individuals, but rather those who have been given leadership in the church. They have been ordained to rule the church. Let us not forget that the church is called the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3. The office bearers have promised to allow themselves to be corrected by the truth of the Bible. That is why they also sought, signed the form for the subscription of office bearers. By signing this form, they promised to uphold the truth as we find it in God's word and as they are summarised in the Confessions. It is important to note that the Confessions are mentioned here. The Holy Spirit has guided the churches throughout the centuries to summarise God's word in such a way that the doctrines as found in the Bible are clearly and succinctly stated, so that no one will refute them. Anyone who says that he has a better insight than the church and that he or she knows better what the will of God is than what the church has confessed through the ages is arrogant. It is disturbing that there are those who claim to be completely led by the Holy Spirit and yet then reject the discipline of the church and withdraw. They arrogantly claim they, that because they have the Spirit, they know better than the church. They alone know what the real truth is. As brothers and sisters in the Lord, we walk humbly amongst one another. We do not elevate anybody to special sainthood. We don't do that to any member of the church, including a specific office bearer or a specific minister. We are all sinful children who need to be led by the Holy Spirit, who guides us in the truth of God's word. We have to remember that we must submit ourselves to God. God knows a lot more than we do. Only he is wise. Only he knows what direction our life should take. Therefore, as a believer, you have to trust the Lord. You have to trust that if you do the right thing, that then God will also bless you, that he will give you the fullness of life. That brings us to our third and final point. <clears throat> the 
Take careful note of the fact that our text says that those who are led by the Spirit are sons or children of God. The present tense is used. It doesn't say that they will become children of God. No, they are children of God. The Apostle Paul points that out further in verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Paul writes this to the believers at Rome and therefore to all believers. That also applies to you and to me. The Holy Spirit confirms us in our faith. You don't need special revelation directly from God in order to confirm you in your faith. All you need to do is believe the Bible and to live in accordance with it. All you have to do is to believe the promises found in the Bible. Although the covenant is not mentioned here in this passage, Paul nevertheless uses covenantal language. He first speaks about the promise of God, namely that he makes us children of God through the Holy Spirit. And then he speaks about the obligation that we have to the Holy Spirit. Once again, God calls us to respond to this work within us. God has taken residence in you, and therefore now you are called a temple of the Holy Spirit. Once you respond to that work within you, then you are also confirmed in the Holy Spirit. Every time you repent from your sin and you ask the Lord for forgiveness, then the Holy Spirit renews you. For then you know everything is well again between you and the Lord God. He gives you new direction. You are given direction through your conscience, which is shaped by the Spirit of God. For God's word has taken up residence within you ever since you were a little child or you became a Christian. Now your conscience accuses you when you do something wrong. And then you can either follow the Holy Spirit or you can follow the flesh or the devil. If you, pray, sorry, if you pray about it with true honesty and openness, allowing yourself to be led by God's word, then you will also know the right, what the right thing is to do. Then you will know it, even though the flesh is telling you to do something else. God gives you a mind to reason things out. He tells you what is right and what is wrong. He tells you in his word. Be led by the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, boys and girls. When you do that, then, and only then, you will receive the fullness of life. Only then will you be able to taste the goodness of life to the fullest. Because the Holy Spirit never steers you wrong. When you follow the Holy Spirit, you go through life with a good conscience. Then you are not anxious about all kinds of things, but you are at peace with yourself and with others. And above all, you are at peace with God. Paul says that it is only through the Holy Spirit that you can cry, Abba, Father. The term Abba is an intimate term. It is like the English word, Daddy. A little child who knows and loves his father feels totally safe and secure around him. To a little child, a father can do no wrong. He is the strongest and the best. He will never harm you. He will always keep you safe. He will chase the monsters away. And he knows everything. It is only through the Holy Spirit that you can have that kind of intimate relationship with your Heavenly Father as well. It is only through the Holy Spirit that you can call him Father with that kind of love and trust. Brothers and sisters, and that includes you, boys and girls, you are special. God has made you special and he takes care of you every day. He protects you. And guides you because he loves you he does that through his Holy Spirit and he will continue to do that throughout your whole life put your trust in him trust his word and he will never mislead you amen